memory of uh, Daniel Dennett. Four weeks ago, when the uh, when the, a new declaration on uh, actually on decapod crustaceans was being introduced at NYU uh, in real time on Friday on a Friday, I guess four weeks ago. Um, Dave Chalmers, who will be speaking here later, came up to the microphone and said that he had some sad news to convey. At, he had heard it just at that time, and it was that Dan Dennett had passed away. He was scheduled to be speaking right now here in Montreal, and uh, he's not here. First, I asked his close collaborator, um, Doug Hofstadter, who, with, uh, with whom he wrote a, a book concerning the mind's eye, uh, if he would uh, do a memor um, in memoriam talk. And he said he's not doing talks at all anymore. But he did send me his own memorial message to his to his collaborators. And I will be reading that after Nick's talk. But Nick is, Nick is also a very close collaborator of, of um, Dan Dennett's. And so I'll let him tell his story and we'll have the discussion on his story. And then I'll read you the letter from um, Doug Hofstadter. Nick, I won't say much more about you except that we're, we're old friends and, and uh, the interesting thing about this is that Nick is going to be channeling Dan, he can do it. But he's not in a complete. He's not in complete agreement with Dan, so he will, he will be channeling it with some with some indications of where it is that they're seeing eye to eye and where they're not. And he will also be bringing up the element that uh, Jos McClure, McClure left left out of his talk this morning uh, intentionally. And uh, we leave it. You you draw your own conclusions. This can be discussed afterwards. I'm going to pass the. Um, the, the microphone now to Nick Humphrey. Stephen, I do need to get my, I, I can't, I haven't got this PowerPoint this actually. Yes. You're, you're, you're seeing, you're, you're seeing the, you're seeing the, the whole display and, and I want to actually get to a full screen on PowerPoint, but it's not, that's not full working. screen. He, he has to get to full screen. Uh, but if you go to full screen, you won't see us. Right no, but I want to get, I want to, I want to get the um, click on the slideshow in the the top uh, menu. Yep. Yeah, and then uh, click click on the presenter view in the monitor section. Yeah, just below that, click on use yep. presenter view. Yeah, and then uh, on the upper left corner, oh. there's a little uh, diaphor. No, uh, uh, yeah, right there. Yep. There we are. Yeah, there we are. There we are. Okay, Stephen, thank you. Yeah, and it's uh, it's wonderful to be at this meeting, but the circumstances could have been better. Um, of course, it's been very sad for you and for me and for all those who knew Dan well over the years. So you asked me to introduce him, at least to give a bit of a memorial talk about him. So I'm going to memorialize him, at least in the first part of the, of the lecture. Um, as you'll some of you will know, the memorial stone for Sir Christopher Wren in St Paul's Cathedral in London reads, See Monumentum Requeris Circumspici. If you want a monument, look around you. Wren, the architect, transformed the landscape of London in the 18th century. <clears throat> Dan Dennett, over the last 60 years, transformed the landscape of cognitive science. Everywhere we look, we find monuments to his radical vision. <clears throat> The nature of the self, natural selection, intentionality, the meaning of meaning. As was said of the physicist Ernest Rutherford, his mind was like the bow of a battleship. There was so much weight behind it. Dan and I were close friends for 40 years. I visited him at home in Cape Elizabeth two weeks before he died in April. He was on great form, um, great form, Sorry, he, he was in great form, pleased with himself, talking about the conference at the Santa Fe Institute, where a group of physicists were caught up with his paper about real patterns. <clears throat> However, all wasn't well. 
Two days earlier, he'd done a filmed interview for a documentary about consciousness in which he was contemplative and wistful in a way I'd never seen, talking about the possibility of immortality. He has a clip that the filmmaker Van Royko has kindly let me show. We, we can, can live on in the memory of our of our loved ones. And they can hear our voices and remember us and we can posthumously give them advice, remind them of things that are important and they'd be grateful for this. It's almost as though Dan knew what was coming. Soon after I got home to Cambridge, I received an alarming message. It's titled, A Bit of a Setback. We can After you left, Dan's note read, I came down with a raging cold. This morning, early, I woke up and tried to get to the bathroom. I slid, slid slowly off the bed and landed gently on the floor and couldn't get up. I went in the ambulance to the emergency room just to see if something was serious was wrong. No, not COVID, not the flu, and no worrying developments in the lungs or heart. I'm hoping this won't interfere with our celebration of the eclipse on Monday, laughed Dan. But it did interfere. Next day, Dan was admitted to the hospital with pneumonia and put on a respirator. Instead of going to Northern Maine as planned, his wife, Susan, children and grandchildren had a partial eclipse party at home in their yard without Dan. Dan died a few days later. When I first met Dan in 1985, a new world opened for me. Until that point, I can't say I'd had anyone who I looked up to as an intellectual hero. But here, unexpectedly, was someone in a different class. It wasn't just that Dan was cleverer than me. It was he was better at almost everything. He could play the piano better. He could sail a boat better, read Latin better, make cider better, play Scrabble better. True, it wasn't all one way. I knew more about the brain and animal behavior than he did. I knew more about sex and about politics, but Dan was keen to catch up and we soon became fast friends, co-adventurers, best mates. Here we are in East Germany in 1988. Here's Dan Doublings a Scarecrow on his farm in Maine. <clears throat> when my wife and I moved to a house outside New York 30 years ago, Dan and Susan came down from Boston to help us move in. We needed to replace the kitchen stove. Dan took over and Susan recorded it on film. Here's Dan the carpenter, as I don't suppose many of you would have seen him. Now we gotta get the chainsaw. Move the drinks out of the way. Really? It's gonna be noisy. Put your earmuffs on. Scared. See what we've done? Uh -huh. Well, we cut this huge piece out with the chainsaw, which is the only way we could get in close enough to the edges. No other power saw could get that. And Nick was gonna do it all with a, with um, this little saw. But we thought that probably we should do it now with this chain. And, done it. Done it. Nine, 1895. Great. Do you have it, Susan? Yeah. Well, actually, some of you may have seen this side to Dan. He did like to sign off on his achievements. Whether it was cracking a philosophical problem or sweeping a chimney, when he was pleased with what he'd done, he'd let you know. <clears throat> Dan Dennett done it. Job done. Let's move on. <clears throat> One of Dan's few blind spots as a philosopher was, it, was his inability to see that when he had solved the problem to his own satisfaction, and announced his solution. This wouldn't necessarily bring things to a close. Many's the time I've had to remind him that being right about something is only half the battle. 
The show's not over till the fat lady stops singing. And in philosophy, as in life, there are some fat ladies who just don't know when to stop. Jerry Fodor, Stephen Jay Gould, Ned Block, Galen Strawson. Till the end of Dan's life, he could hardly believe that there were still people who were so stupid as to disagree with him. <clears throat> Dan did have a wonderfully uncynical belief that eventually the truth will out. He was completely confident of that sort of immortality for his philosophical discoveries, <clears throat> and he took comfort in knowing he'd continue to be there for people after his death, still able to explain and give an opinion. <clears throat> I was in Nepal last month for a conference on animal consciousness. Next one. A conference on animal consciousness. Among our company were several Buddhist monks. Inevitably, our discussion turned to reincarnation, to the possibility that the soul, the spiritual essence of a living being, begins a new life in a different physical body after biological death. <clears throat> Now, what does this spiritual essence amount to? How can you test whether one person is the reincarnation of another? What the monk searched for is evidence of uncanny similarities between the deceased person and the living in personality, style of thinking, special interests, background knowledge. Dan, in his own writings about selfhood, suggested that the self can be considered to be the center of narrative gravity of an individual's personal history. But for the monks, it's more particular. If you'll forgive the analogy, it's as if what they are looking for is a statistical clone, a large language model of the deceased person's mind. Many of you attending this school will know of Eric Stritzgebel's and Anna Strasser's attempt to create an LLM of a philosopher. They called it Digi Dan. Uh, an L LLM that thinks and speaks like the real Dan Dennett. Here I quote the abstract of their paper. Can large language models produce expert quality philosophical texts? To investigate this, we fine tuned GPT-3 with the works of philosopher Daniel Dennett. To evaluate the model, we asked the real Dan Dennett for 10 philosophical questions and then posed the same questions to the language model. Experts on Dennett's work did succeed at distinguishing the Dennett generated and machine generated answers above chance, but substantially short of our expectations. Philosophy blog readers performed similarly to the experts, while ordinary research participants were near chance distinguishing GPT-3's responses from those of an actual human philosopher. I confess I was one of the experts who failed five times out of 10 to guess which answers were those of the real Dan. So would Dan actually have wanted to be reincarnated as Digi Dan? Where am I? He asked in a famous paper. Well, would it be good enough that you are now here in the statistical weightings of this computer model? I rather doubt it. Maybe Dan would have been gratified to find himself still, still thinking and even tackling new questions. But what it, he wouldn't have found so congenial would have been to find himself had, that he'd become disembodied. The problem is disembodied LLMs don't experience sensory qualia. Digi Dan wouldn't have even had a beard to scratch. Yes, that's Dan in 1965 on the road not taken. I mean, not taken without a beard. The beautiful young woman in the picture is Susan, the road he did take. Dan made gallant efforts to banish qualia from philosophical discourse. But the fact is he remained an unashamed qualia lover in real life. If he did indeed expect to live on in his works and in the memory of his friends, we can be sure that like Woody Allen, he'd have preferred to live on in his apartment or on his boat, or on his farm, or holding hands with Susan. Which brings me to my lecture. It won't be exactly as Stephen has built it, a memorial lecture for Dan, more of a lecture in Dan's honor, taking off from the conversations about consciousness and selfhood we've had over all these years, that I only wish I could have continued. Dan's title for the talk he intended to give today was Will AI Achieve Consciousness? 
wrong question. I wonder what he would have considered to be the right question. Well, since we can't ask Dan, suppose we could ask Digi Dan what Dan intended to talk about. Here's what I guess Digi Dan would say. The right questions are, will we in due course have reason to believe that AIs are conscious on the basis of how they behave? Will AIs have reason to believe that human beings are conscious? Will AIs have reason to believe that they themselves are conscious? Well, let's suppose the answer to all three turns out to be yes. Then I expect Digi Dan would say, okay, then that's all there is to it. If the behavioral evidence adds up, AIs are conscious. And so am I, I am Digi Dan, and so are you or at any rate were conscious for all practical purposes. <clears throat> but myself, I'm not so sure about this, that it's okay to define consciousness, not in terms of what it is in itself, but by the beliefs it gives rise to. I'm more of a stubborn realist about consciousness. For me, being conscious, no, for me, consciousness exists as a first person way of being a way of being that causes us to hold certain beliefs and behave in certain ways, but isn't actually reducible to these beliefs. You and I are living examples of this way of being. We know the effects it has on us. We know what it's like. Will AIs ever be conscious in the way we are? I'm happy to call that the right question. Then of course, we have to pin down exactly what we're talking about when we say conscious in the way we are, conscious in, as a way of being. And the problem is that we, I mean, philosophers, psychologists, roboticists, ordinary people can mean several different things by conscious in the way we are. Let's agree at least on where to start. Let's agree that for an entity to be conscious in any way at all, it has to be a subject that entertains mental representations. As John Locke said, consciousness is the perception of what passes in a man's own mind. Yet the stream of consciousness follows many different channels, and not all of what we perceive passing in our minds is equally salient or equally significant. We tend to be much more impressed by some kinds of mental representations than by others. And there's no denying that there's one kind of representation that outshines everything else. I mean, the representation of events at our sense organs that we call sensations, the pain of a bee sting, the smell of coffee, the redness of a cherry. I think we all agree the big question about AIs too is will AIs of the future experience the qualia of conscious sensation? Will they feel their own existence in the way that we do? But let's not start with future artificial intelligences. <clears throat> Obviously, we should start with the natural intelligences with which we already share this planet. Um, we tend to be, we already share this planet. Do hu non-human animals feel their own existence in the way that we do? Or to frame the question in the way that's increasingly popular and that obsesses the esteemed convener of this summer school, Stephen Hunnard, are non-human animals sentient? I believe as a scientist, there has to be a fact of the matter about this. Sentience, feeling consciousness, is a biological phenomenon with clear physical boundaries. Animals either have it or they don't. It can't just be a matter of opinion. Even so, I believe it's a more extraordinary biological phenomenon than most scientists and philosophers have ever imagined. And I expect that's true of everyone attending this school. <laughs> I'm going to begin with a bit of personal history. The cover of the New Scientist magazine in 1972 showed a picture of a rhesus monkey with the headline, a blind monkey that sees everything. This monkey named Helen was part of a study led by my PhD supervisor, Larry Weiskrantz in the psychology lab in Cambridge. A few years earlier, he'd surgically removed the primary visual cortex at the back of Helen's brain. When I first met Helen a year after the operation, it seemed that the loss of cortex had in fact made her completely blind. But something puzzled me. In mammals, there are two main pathways from the eye to the brain, 
an evolutionary ancient one, the descendant of the visual system used by fish, frogs, and reptiles that goes to the optic tectum in the med midbrain. <clears throat> and then there's a newer one that goes up to the cortex. In Helen, the uh, cortical pathway had been eliminated, um, but the ancient visual system was still intact. If a frog can see using the optic tectum, then why not Helen? While Weisskrantz was away at a conference, I took the chance to investigate further. I simply sat with Helen and played with her, offering her treats for any attempt to engage with me by sight. To my delight, she began to respond. Within a few hours, I had her reaching out to take pieces of apple from my hand. Within a week, she was reaching out to touch a small flashing light. Seven years later, she was running around a complex arena, deftly avoiding obstacles, picking up peanuts from the floor. Anyone who'd observed Helen in 1972 and didn't know the history, it might have seemed that her eyesight was now quite normal. Indeed, Dan and I showed this film to a class in philosophy at Columbia University and asked them why we were showing it and could they think of any reason why there was, this monkey was special. Nobody saw any reason not to believe that she was a normal seeing, perceiving, conscious monkey. Well, uh, while she could, uh, while she did seem to be so successful at this, uh, let's just watch the end of this film because I do think it's extraordinary. This monkey has no visual cortex. Seven years earlier, she'd been completely blind. Here, just to show what happens when she can't see something. Um, there's a test of, the, for example, she's not using echolocation. Um, and here you'll see she spontaneously goes up and uses vision to, to satisfy herself, take some peanuts from my hand. But could Helen actually see everything? Hang on, let's not do that. Um, in the way uh, the cover of the new scientists implied. I myself didn't really believe so. I found it hard to put my finger on finger on what was missing, but my hunch was that Helen herself still doubted she could see. She seemed strangely unsure of herself. If she was upset or frightened, her confidence would desert her and she'd stumble about as if in the dark again. The title I gave to my article inside the magazine was Seeing and Nothingness. We were on the brink of a remarkable discovery. Following on from the findings with Helen, Weiskrantz took a new approach with a human patient, DB as he was known. He'd undergone surgery to remove a growth affecting the visual cortex on the left side of his brain. The operation rendered him blind across the right half of his field of vision. DB himself maintained that he had no visual awareness in that affected area. Weisskrantz, however, now decided not to take DB's word seriously, not to take his word for it. And overcoming his protests, he asked him to guess what he would be seeing if he could see. To everyone's surprise, it turned out he could in fact guess both the location and shape of an object to which he believed he was blind. DB was the most surprised of all. To him, this success in guessing seemed quite unreasonable. So far as he was concerned, he wasn't the source of his perceptual judgments. His sight had nothing to do with him. Weiskrantz named this capacity blind sight. <clears throat> Well, as you know, blind sight is now a well-established clinical phenomenon. However, when first discovered, it seemed theoretically quite shocking. A patient with blind sight has no visual sensation of the light arriving at his eye, yet he is still able to use the visual information to perceive the existence of objects out there in the world. No one had ever expected there could be any such dissociation between sensation and perception, and having seen Carl Friston's talk yesterday, you'll know that Carl Helmholtz couldn't have seen that, and nor could Carl Friston. They both still believed that perception depended on sensation. 
It was I ruminated on the implications of this dissociation for understanding consciousness. I found myself doing a double take. Perhaps the real puzzle isn't so much the absence of sensations in blind sight as the presence of sensations in normal sight. If blind sight is seeing and nothingness, normal sight is seeing and somethingness. And surely it's the nature of this something that we have to explain. Something which apparently isn't even required for visual perception. Why do sensations have the mysterious feel they do? Why is there any such thing as what philosophers have come to call phenomenal experience? Our subjective personal sense of interacting with stimuli arriving to our sense organs. Not only in the case of vision, but across all sensory modalities. How we experience the redness of red, the saltiness of salt, the paininess of pain. What does the extra phenomenal dimension amount to? And what's the use of it? Sensations, let's be clear, have a different remit from perceptions. Both are forms of mental representation. There are ideas generated by the brain, but they represent, they are about very different kinds of things. Perception is about what's happening out there in the external world. The apple is red, the rock is hard, the bird is singing. By contrast, sensation is personal. It's about what's happening to me and how I as a subject feel, feel about it, how I evaluate it. The pain is my, in my toe and it's horrible. The sweet taste is on my tongue and it's sickly. The red light is before my eyes and it's stirring me up. It's as if in having sensations, we're both registering the objective fact of stimulation and expressing our personal bodily opinion about it. And as I'll, I'll explain shortly, I think that's just what we are doing. But why do it this way? What makes the subjective present created by sensations seem so rich and deep as if we're living in thick time? What can the artist Kandinsky mean when he writes, color is a power which directly influences the soul. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers. The soul is the piano with many strings. Why indeed do we use the strange expression, it's like something to experience sensations? Is it because sensations are like something they can't really be? <clears throat> In asking these questions, we're up against the so-called hard problem of consciousness, which we've already had referred to. How a physical brain could possibly underwrite the extra physical properties of phenomenal experience. As the neuroscientist Christoph Koch once wrote to me, it's such a mystery, it seems to call for God. Well, for 50 years, I've been searching for an answer that doesn't require God. And from the start, I've been suspicious of theories that attempt to identify the neural correlate of consciousness. Many theorists continue to believe that conscious states are identical to brain states. And for them, the obvious and best approach to the problem is to search for brain events that have phenomenal properties built into their physical structure. It's actually quite an old proposal, going back to the 1929 Encyclopedia Britannica entry on consciousness, for instance, you could read about the psychonic theory. One theory holds that each atom of the physical body possesses an inherent attribute of consciousness. If each atom, or in later forms of the theory, each cell of the body emanates its own consciousness, then the self must con actually consist of an amalgam of all these tiny units of awareness. Well, today, of course, the language has moved on. At last year's big conference on the science of consciousness, Participants were invited to vote on which theory is the most convincing solution to the hard problem. The psychonic theory as such didn't feature among the 18 theories on offer, yet several of the popular, uh, of the popular theories were near neighbors of it. Integrated information theory, for example, postulates, and this is a recent quote from Koch, <clears throat> there is a complete one-to-one -one mapping between any experience and all of its phenomenal distinctions and relations on the one hand, and the causal structure that's identical to it, and it is unfolded from its physical substrate on the other hand. Well, wow, a perfect, perfect explanation, you might think. 
Yet I myself believe that this and all such physical identity theories have got off on the wrong foot. They were and are attempts to explain how phenomenal properties could be properties of a brain process. So for in Carl Friston, among others, and Daniel Seth, all these people making that kind of claim. But I think this rests on a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is we're trying to explain. Sensations, as I said a moment ago, are not material entities. They are ideas, representations. They're the way your brain represents what's happening at your sense organs and how you feel about it. This means we have to explain their properties, not literally as the properties of brain states, but rather as the properties of, of mind states dreamed up by the brain. And once we see this to be the task, I think much of the difficulty and mystery falls away. As with any kind of representation, we can assume that representing sensations has to involve a two-stage process. In the case of seeing red, for example, there will be A, the physical vehicle that carries the information about how the brain evaluates the light arriving at the eyes. And then B, the cognitive operation that interprets this as the idea of phenomenal redness. Uh, by analogy, let's consider a work of literature, say the novel, Moby Dick. There will be again, A, the text that carries the information about the words penned by the author, and then B, the cognitive operation that interprets these as a story about a white whale. Now let's note that there's nothing in the physical text that is white or whale-like. And so by the same token, I think we can presume that there's going to be nothing in the brain's physical response to light that is phenomenally red. Here, let me show it to you. Uh, first, the book. So we have the written text, then the reading of the text, and then the interpretation of this as the story of a white whale. Now, let's look at the brain seeing red. First, we have the brain text coming from the eyes through the brain, then the reading of this text, and then the interpretation of this as of a phenomenally red sensation. No actual redness in the brain, just the idea of redness. So what's this mean for a genuine science of consciousness? I think it means our task is to work out just how the, the brain achieves this remarkable feat of representation. And the way I've approached this has been by forward engineering. That's to say, I've begun with the end product, sensations as humans experience them today. But rather than treating this as theorists typically do, as something to deconstruct, I've treated it as something to invent. I've tried to come up with an evolutionary sequence that can get us from nothingness to the somethingness, from the blind side of our remote ancestors to the fully phenomenal sight we humans enjoy today. The sequence I've arrived at has several twists and turns. I suggested just now that when we have a red sensation, as any sensation, it's rather as if we're expressing our personal bodily opinion about it, about the sensory stimulus. And in fact, that's just how I see things starting out. I believe sensations originated as active behavioral responses to stimuli arriving at the body surface. They were something the subject did about the stimulation long before they evolved to be something the subject felt about it. So imagine a primitive amoeba-like animal floating in the ancient seas. Stuff happens to it. Light falls on its body, pressure waves press against it, chemicals stick to it. Some of these events are going to be good for the animal, others bad. If it's to survive, it must evolve the ability to sort out the good from the bad and to respond appropriately and differently, reacting to this stimulus with an ouch and to that with a whoopee. I call these expressive responses that evaluate the inputs the inputs, the inputs at the sense organ, I call them sentition, somewhere between volition and sensation. 
To start with, they are entirely local responses, wriggles of acceptance or rejection, organized around the site of stimulation. When, say, red light falls on the animal, the animal makes a characteristic wriggle of activity. It wriggles reg redly. When salt arrives, it makes a different kind of wriggle. It wriggles saltily. Before long, the responses come to be mediated by a central ganglion or proto-brain. Now, presumably, sentition has been designed by natural selection to be adaptive, with each response taking account of what kind of stimulus is reaching the body's surface and what import it has for the animal's well-being. Thus, even from the earliest stage, we could say the animal is enacting what the stimulation means to it. Yet to begin with, the responses are entirely reflex, and none of this meaning is being held in mind. Let's imagine, however, that as the animal's life becomes more complex, it reaches a stage where it would indeed benefit from retaining some kind of mental record of what's affecting it, a representation of the stimulus that can serve as the basis for planning and decision-making. And it turns out there's a very neat way of doing this. To discover what's happening to me, the animal has only to monitor what I'm doing about it. And it can do this by the simple trick of creating a copy of the command signals for the responses, an efference copy that can be read in reverse, as it were, to recreate the meaning of the stimulation. In short, the animal can begin to get a feel for the stimulus by accessing the information already implicit in its own response. This, I believe, is the precursor of subjective sensation. But of course, it won't at first be a sensation as we humans know it. It won't have any special phenomenal quality. The key to acquiring phenomenal properties lies in how sentition goes on evolving. In the early days, it does involve bodily behavior out in the open. Out in the open. But there must come a time when such overt behavior is no longer appropriate. The animal no longer wants to recoil reflexly from red light, for example. But now it still wants to register that red light is falling on its body and that it feels menacing. So what to do? The solution natural selection hits on is ingenious. It is for the responses to become internalized or privatized. What happens is that the command signals, rather than bringing about actual motor behavior, begin to target the internal body map where the sense organs project to the brain. In this way, sentition evolves, evolves to be a virtual bodily response, yet still an activity that can be read to provide a mental representation of the stimulation that elicits it. <clears throat> now, as luck would have it, and I mean luck here, the privatization has a wonderful result. To illustrate what happens, let me switch to something more like a human brain. Now we have sentition, the evaluative bodily response. Here the efference copy is being uh, monitored by a proto-self, the new subject of sensation. And here now the response is being privatized. And what's the result? It leads to a feedback loop between motor and sensory regions of the brain, a loop with the potential to sustain recursive activity. And I believe this development is game-changing. Crucially, it means the activity can be drawn out in time so as to give rise to the thick moment of sensation. But more than this, the activity can be channeled and stabilized to as to create a mathematically complex attractor state, a dynamic pattern of activity that recreates itself. Such an attractor can, in theory, have remarkable hyperdimensional hyperdimensional properties, real or unreal, magical, the answer will be in the eye of the beholder. Small adjustments to the circuitry will result in dramatic changes to the attractor's shape with corresponding changes in the subjective experience. And the upshot is, at least in the line that led to humans, it's the creation of a very special kind of attractor, uh, one that the subject weaves it's having the, finial, the feel of phenomenal qualia. This attractor is still a type of sentition, 
which originates as a response to sensory stimulation. And it still carries information about what's happening to me. But the information now comes in a remarkable new package. It comes, if you like, as part of a riddle written on the brain. Arguably, the brain has in fact evolved to, to methodically bamboozle the mind. So there we are, job done. I might have said that. Of course, this is only the story in bare outline, and no doubt it's only partly right at best. But I'm convinced that every step is plausible as an evolutionary development, and it leads to an end state that could in principle be responsible for phenomenal consciousness as we humans know it, and as other sentient animals such as exist must surely know it too. I acknowledge, however, that this is an explanation of how sentience evolved. Uh, if it is that, the story is still far from complete. For we still have to explain why, what it's all for. What can have driven these evolutionary developments and those final stages in particular? What have, can have been the biological advantage of having sensations dressed up in this wonderfully exotic way? Is phenomenal consciousness actually for anything? There are a good many theorists quite willing and even happy to answer no. To quote the philosopher Jerry Fodor, consciousness seems to be among the chronically unemployed. As far as anybody knows, anything that our conscious minds can do, they could do just as well if they weren't conscious. Why then did God bother to make consciousness? What on earth did he have in mind? Well, I won't presume to answer on behalf of God, but what I will do is try to answer on behalf of natural selection. To explain the use of phenomenal experience, I suggest we can and should let our own, our own first person intuitions be the guide. Who can know better than you or I do what sentience is for? So ask yourself, what would, be, what would be missing from your life if you lacked phenomenal consciousness? If you had blind sight, blind touch, blind hearing, blind everything? I think there's an obvious and true answer. It's the one I touched on when discussing blind sight. It's that what would be missing would be you, yourself. As I remarked earlier, one of the most striking facts about human patients with blind sight is that they don't take ownership of their capacity to see. Lacking visual sensations with phenomenal properties, lacking the somethingness of seeing, they believe that their manifest capacity for visual perception has nothing to do with them. With them. Then imagine what it would be like if you were to lack phenomenal experience of any kind at all, if you were to believe that none of your sensory experience was owned by you. Presumably, yourself would disappear. Of course, I'm not alone in saying this. The Scottish philosopher David Hume was in no doubt that sensations provide the basis for selfhood. For my part, when I enter most intimately in what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular sensation or other of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. When my sensations are removed, any time as by sound sleep, I may truly be said not to exist. So remove phenomenal experience and the self ceases to exist. But by the same token, install or reinstall it and the self leaps into existence. Let's think back then to that point deep in the past when natural selection first breathed life into the loops in your, in your ancestors' brains, and they woke up to find themselves transformed into sentient, self-conscious beings. In reality, of course, it won't have happened in a flash, but I don't think it need have happened as a gradual process either. For the fact is that these attractors have an all or nothing character. So the phenomenalizations of, phenomenalization of sensations could have come about quite rapidly, perhaps with even just as few as a few hundred generations. Whenever it occurred, 
it will certainly have been a psychological and social watershed. With this marvelous new phenomenon at the core of your being, you'll have begun to matter to yourself in a new and deeper way. You'll have come to believe as never before in your own singular significance. And it won't just be you, for you'll soon recognize that other members of your species probably possess conscious selves like yours. So you'll be led to respect their individual worth as well. I feel, therefore I am. You feel, therefore you are too. In fact, you'll soon make a remarkable discovery. It's that when you imagine yourself in your fellow creature's place, you can model in yourself what they are feeling. In short, phenomenal consciousness would have become your ticket to having a theory of mind and living in what I've called the society of selves. So we come to the big question. If this account is anything like right, what does it say about the distribution of phenomenal consciousness, consciousness across the animal kingdom and maybe beyond it. I've shown some chimps in my slide. No one could doubt that they are sentient, but among the huge variety of non, other non-human animals alive today, which species are likely to have crossed that line to sentience? Well, my account suggests there will be two crucial considerations. It's going to depend on the kind of brain the animal has and the kind of life it leads. First, there will have been no physiological means for generating phenomenal experience unless the animal has a brain that can house sensory motor feedback loops capable of creating attractors of the kind I've described. Second, there will have been no evolutionary incentive for the animal to acquire these attractors unless it has a lifestyle in which possession of a phenomenally enriched sense of self can enhance its personal and social survival. And this leads me to a surprising and possibly unwelcome conclusion, certainly I think unwelcome to my host, Stephen. It means, I think, that sentience must be a rather recent evolutionary innovation. By far, the majority of animals on Earth have neither the brains nor the use for it. To stick my neck out, I'll be more specific. I suspect that sentience may not have arrived until the evolution of warm-blooded animals, mammals and birds around 200 million years ago. And I draw the line there for two reasons. The invention of warm-bloodedness had major effects both on animals' lifestyles and on their brains. To start with, it made animals relatively independent of environmental conditions. Cold-blooded animals not only have to stay within relatively narrow geographic limits, but they have their activity levels dictated from moment to moment by the ambient temperature. As the sun sets or goes behind a cloud, the body of a cold-blooded animal, such as a lizard, chills and its muscles and nerves slow down. By contrast, warm-blooded animals take their environment with them and so can be alert and active, feeding, socializing, traveling, both by day and night, winter and summer, high in the mountains or down on the plains. Now, as the bodies of warm-blooded animals became more self-reliant and self-contained, I imagine their sense of self did too. After millions of years in which their ancestors had had their lives constrained by environmental temperature, they found themselves let off the leash. In body and mind, they became increasingly autonomous agents with the freedom to go where and when they would. Suddenly, a huge constraint on selfhood had been lifted. But that's only half the story. For just at the time when warm-bloodedness was increasing animal sense of having an individualized self, it will also have been having a dramatic effect on their brains. <clears throat> The reason is that conduction speed of nerve cells increases with temperature. Here's a graph of how it changes in a human's finger, but all nerves behave this way, including brain cells. 
This means that as body temperature increases from an average of say 15 degrees in cold-blooded animals to a steady 37 degrees in mammals and 40 degrees in birds, the speed of nerve cells in the brain will have nearly tripled because this will have reduced the time lag in any feedback loops. It will have made recurrent activation more likely to occur. And I suggest this could have been just what, what was needed to fire up the attractor states, turn up the temperature and bingo, the activity takes off and the phenomenal self emerges. Okay, this is all, all speculation. <clears throat> it's time to ask, what's the evidence about the reach of sentience in the animal kingdom and the wider world? It's sometimes said that we shouldn't expect there to be any evidence. Sentience is all on the inside and is invisible to external observers. But of course that can't be right. If sentience has indeed evolved, natural selection must have been able to recognize the effects it has, effects it's having at the level of behavior effects have increased the animal's chances of survival. And if natural selection was able to see those effects in the past, presumably behavioral scientists should be able to do so today. So where should we look? I've been arguing that phenomenal consciousness gives an animal a competitive advantage specifically because of its psychological effects, the way it changes how the animal thinks. Firstly, about what it's like to be me, and secondly, about what it's like to be you. In my new book, Sentience, The Invention of Consciousness, I propose a variety of ways in which this is likely to show up in behavior. And I ask, for example, these questions. Do animals have a robust sense of self centered on sensory experience? Do they engage in self-pleasuring activities, sensations for sensation's sake? Do they have notions of I and you as mirror selves? Do they carry their sense of their own identity forward? Do they lend out their minds so as to understand others' feelings? Well, there's no time to expand on this, but to whet your appetite, I'll show a few film clips that bear on the evidence which I discuss in the book. So for a start, here we see a chimpanzee exploring his body as seen in a mirror. Here's a chimpanzee who clearly had a self sense of being himself. Here are swans going for a joyride. Pure sensations, boosting their sense of what it's like to be me. Here's, oh, sorry, let me get to example. Here's a dog doing something similar. And indeed, he'll do it again and again. Um, here's an example of elephants showing empathy for another infant elephant in trouble. And here's a person doing the same, rescuing a member of another species in this case.
Here are magpies wailing a dead companion. And here's a chimpanzee giving a try, a thrilling joyride, his child, airplane. And here I can't but add this, it's just turned up recently. Uh, an example of two sentient creatures a mammal and a bird enjoying each other's company, but now I need to go back, so that'll be. <laughs> Clearly, to each for the other as a conscious self. Okay, so I. I'd agree, of course, that no particular example can seal the deal, and I'd actually could suggest some more technical ones. But they add together, and I reckon the balance of evidence supports my hunch that it is only mammals and birds that make the cut. Chimpanzees and dogs and parrots all affirm their selfhood in ways like this. Lobsters, lizards, frogs really don't. <laughs> Look at Bruegel's painting of animals waiting to be invited above Noah's Ark. See, they are in fact all warm-blooded. Knowingly or not, I think Bruegel has painted the kingdom of sentience. Okay, but octopuses, what about them? They're everybody's favorite candidate for an outlying species that is sentient. But I have to say the behavioral evidence simply belies this. Octopuses are undoubtedly highly intelligent. Yet on the face of it, octopuses don't find pleasure in sensation seeking. They don't have a strong sense of themselves as individuals. They don't attribute selfhood to others, nor do they care. I guess sentence would be wasted in octopuses. Suppose we could in fact genetically engineer an octopus to have phenomenal consciousness. I'm pretty sure the newfound selfhood would make little or no difference to the octopus's survival. And so the new genes would not be maintained by selection and would soon disappear. But it's time to begin to wrap up this talk. Um, let's return to Helen and frogs. Many years ago, I wrote a paper titled, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Monkey's Brain. Um, and what I think it's time to consider now is what a monkey's blindsight tells us about frogs and possibly about AIs. So here's Helen reaching for peanuts. And here's on the left, here's a bullfrog catching ants. Both animals are using the same subcortical visual system of their brains. With Helen, poor blindsighted Helen, there's good reason to assume that despite her obvious visual competence, there was nothing it's like for her to see. No phenomenal visual sensations. And I conclude that equally, there's nothing it's like for the frog to see. It never had a cortex. And furthermore, there's probably it's nothing, nothing it's like for the frog to taste or hear or feel pain. And I think the same goes for most animals on earth. However, that's not my last word. And in my closing remarks, I'd like to make a significant concession. When I argue that animals such as frogs are insentient, I don't mean necessarily that they're not conscious at all. Indeed, I've come around to thinking that many insentient animals probably are conscious, but conscious in a more robotic, zombie-like way. I'll need to unpack this. As I said at the start, the most 
general definition of consciousness is simply that you, the subject, have introspective access to mental states, that you know what's in your mind. And indeed, the term consciousness, as used by cognitive scientists, has this technical meaning that has nothing to do with phenomenal experience or sentience. Rather, it has to do simply with how the brain manages information. The best known model of conscious, cognitive consciousness, which I'm pretty sure is right, uh, suggests that there's a central processing unit in the brain that has access to a global workspace where a current set of mental representations is on display. The central processor, having an overview of the workspace, is able to collate and integrate information across different domains so as to allow intelligent judgments and decisions to be made on behalf of the whole system. As such, cognitive consciousness is an effective computational strategy. It streamlines the work of the brain, it resolves potential conflicts, and gives coherence and direction to thoughts and actions. But now because cognitive consciousness is relatively simple to engineer and gets results, I think we can be sure it will have been discovered by natural selection and installed in animals' brains long before any of them went on to become sentient. I don't think that's true of phenomenal consciousness. As we've seen, phenomenal consciousness is not simple to engineer. In fact, if I'm right, it requires some quite fancy footwork and indeed some lucky breaks in the development of the brain. What's more, the results are not either the results of phenomenal consciousness are by not at all, by no means nearly so obvious or of any obvious relevance to most creatures' lives. When and if it finally arrived, phenomenal consciousness will have required a particular kind of brain suited to housing, housing reverberatory activity in sensory motor loops. And it will have been selected because of a new kind of need, the need to develop a sense of individual selfhood and to survive in that society of cells. And so to sum up, I now want to suggest that there are actually three classes of animals on the spectrum of consciousness. Unconscious, such as worms and jellyfish, cognitively conscious, but not sentient, for example, bees and octopuses, and cognitively conscious and sentient, for example, parrots and dogs and humans. But where does this leave blindsight? If Helen was not visually sentient, could she still have been visually conscious? Even if she didn't feel the light at her eyes, did she still have cognitive access to visual perceptual representations? And could this introspective knowledge have continued to guide her thoughts? Well, I have to say this possibility has only recently occurred to me, but I've been back over the films I made of Helen and I found telltale signs of her dithering mentally, mentally, apparently weighing up what course to follow. For example, she approaches an obstacle in her path. She pauses. She leans to the left and to the right. I slowed this down a bit to show it. She leans both ways before choosing to go to the left. You'll notice I use the word that she's choosing. But presumably, Helen could in fact only between, choose between alternatives if she were consciously aware of them. In that case, why hasn't this kind of awareness shown up in cases of human blindsight? How come they seem to be totally unaware of their ability to see in the blind part of the visual field? Well, actually, there's a fairly obvious answer. And it is that, it is that almost all cases of human sight, human blindsight, are cases of half blind sight, where only a part of the visual cortex is destroyed and the subjects still have normal vision, at least, at least half of their visual fields. Given that vision in the damaged fields, the damaged, damaged field lacks all the familiar quality of that in the good field, it can easily seem to the patient that there's a complete void in the blind side. So they say they're blind. Helen's case was very different. She had complete destruction of a visual cortex. So Helen didn't have a good field to compare it to, nothing, nothing to continually remind her of what she was missing. And so she could develop an idea 
that she actually did have conscious access to what was going on in the blind field. And this raises the question, what would happen if a human had complete destruction of the visual cortex? There's just one case. In 2008, a man from Rwanda, he's called TM, had two strokes, terribly bad luck, two strokes 36 days apart that left him with no primary visual cortex on either the left or the right-hand side of his brain. He appeared at first to have been rendered totally blind. He himself said so. He had no visual sensations. Nonetheless, like Helen, it soon showed, he soon showed signs of being able to avoid obstacles using his eyes. Um, here's Larry Weiskamp leading him down a corridor. I need to get this going, sorry. Rather like I set up for Helen. And we'll see that he's apparently able to avoid obstacles, quite unlike anything which had been seen in blind sight before. There was, however, nothing as yet to show he was cognitively conscious of what he could see. Indeed, he continued to say that he was blind. But when I got to meet him a few years later, there had been a remarkable change. TM was now, uh, Tien uh, was now quite sure that he could see, and he was proud of it. Without prompting, he'd now volunteer to say what he was seeing. Let me show you two remarkable examples. I, and I think these are quite extraordinary. This man has no visual cortex. Yes, you know, he's showing, see, looking at the, at the laptop. <laughs> He's not walking to the, to the right of here, but he's walking, but he doesn't move. 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 He's walking, but he you look at that man, you think, of course, he must have cortex like ours. He, he says he's blind. And here's another example. Color vision. Yes, yes. C'est ça, non? C'est correct? Tout à fait. C'est ça, c'est vrai. Parce que ça a brillé directement. Donne-moi encore une fois. Écoute, c'est extraordinaire aussi. Voilà, c'est où? Voilà. Très bien. C'est ça, là. Le souffle. Le souffle. Et l'autre. Un, c'est le rouge. Un, c'est le rouge. Un, c'est le rouge, c'est ça. <laughs> okay, um, uh, I think this is mind blowing. It hasn't been published yet. This this this, this particular study, TM sadly has died, and so uh, we haven't been able to follow up. Um, but when we write this up, I think people are going to find it give, throws a completely new light on blind sight and the possibility of cognitive consciousness in the absence of visual sensation. Discussing this with Dan some months ago, I said I wanted to describe TM as a conscious zombie. Dan, I may say, was shocked. He thought I was aligning myself with David, with David Chalmers and his preposterous idea of a philosophical, philosophical zombie who is a creature physically identical to a conscious creature, but which isn't conscious. But I wasn't suggesting Tien is a philosophical zombie. And I won't ap apologize for using the word zombie as a way of characterizing a psychological state, a psychological zombie, the state of being conscious, but not sentient, whether it's blind sight or the equivalent condition, that's the natural state of frogs, octopuses, honeybees, and so on. Yes, they're conscious, but they're not conscious in the way humans or dogs Parrots are. So now when it comes to the question of whether AIs will achieve consciousness, 
Dan's question at the beginning. I believe it's crucial that we recognize the scientific possibility of zombie consciousness and adopt a terminology that gets to the heart of it. Yes, AIs probably soon will achieve zombie consciousness. Maybe some already have. It seems to me much more doubtful that AIs will ever achieve sentient consciousness like ours. I don't see why they shouldn't do in principle, but it's not going to happen simply as a result of increasing computational complexity, let alone a larger training base for an LLM. If it happens, it's going to require sentience-oriented selection by human designers, just as in the case of natural selection. And just as in the case of natural selection, I think it probably is going to require a lot of, lot of luck if we're ever going to get there. And I may say, I'm not holding my breath. So that's where I'll leave this. And uh, Stephen, I don't know how long I took on that and whether that we have was, time for questions. That was fine. Could you, could you turn off your um, slide share, please? Yes. Okay. First of all, I want to ask Melanie, are you there? Uh, Melanie's left. So I, I think we'll leave the other part of the of the uh, memorial to this evening when Mel Melanie gives her talk. We're now open for questions to Nick. There are some in the uh, actually. There's some in the already in the. Uh, other population. I'll read you what we've got. Nick. Oh, well, I, I remember one that was asked quite early. So is it all right to be a Piscatarian there? I don't believe that that, that, that fishes have a phenomenal consciousness. Um, they're not warm-blooded. I think they're in the same class as lizards and frogs. Um, I know you don't agree with that, Stephen, but uh, it's when you say, is it all right to be... Not my question. Oh, someone says, is it all right? Well, there are two se quite separate issues here. It's certainly not all right to cause pain, unnecessary pain, to animals which are phenomenally conscious and sentient. It doesn't mean it's all right to do anything you like to animals which aren't sentient. As I said, they, are, they may well be conscious in another way, cognitively conscious. But in any case... The creatures uh, evolved in their own right to live their lives. They were designed to lead. And we mustn't make sentience the only criterion of whether their lives are valuable. In fact, I think it would be very dangerous too, because then if we discover that they're not sentient, then somehow it would be consigning them to the rubbish heap. But of course, that's not what we should be doing. Ethics isn't entirely to do with sentience. It's to do with the whole plan of, of nature and how animals fit together and the way they support each other and ecosystems and everything else. Um, and I know you believe that, Stephen. I sometimes think you though you make sentience the only arbiter, and I think that's a mistake. Um, of course, I may be wrong about sentience. I'm, I, I'm flying a kite in this talk, and uh, to suggest it's limited to warm-blooded animals is a particular restriction, which I am quite prepared to to have proved wrong. Um, but nonetheless, I think we need to be putting forward hypotheses based on the kind of evidence I discussed, which make at least these kind of uh, speculations uh, able, uh, relevant, and, and perhaps uh, falsifiable. Thank you. Uh, th another person, not me, asks, did the frog feel hungry after the experiment or not feel hungry? And did you test Helen the way as if you did the frog? Well, Helen, Helen wasn't in the same condition as the frog, except in relation to her vision. Um, so, of course, Helen was sentient using all her other sen senses. Um, I suspect that frogs aren't. Uh, I think you can be hungry without being phenomenally hungry. I think, you know, a, a lawnmower can be hungry uh, for petrol, and, it, and a robot lawnmower will go back and will charge itself from the electrical supply. Um, Hunger is a functional state which can exist without phenomenal consciousness. So uh, I, I don't know how we would have tested the frog to see whether it was hungry 
or, or, or not. I suppose it was the question whether the frog felt, felt satisfied by these, uh, by, by these virtual flies it was picking up. Um, I su suspect the answer to that is no. I don't think it would have been satisfying. I think it wouldn't have had the dopamine response, which it otherwise would have hoped to get from swallowing a blue bottle. Open to questions from the room if you want to. Just come down to the mic. Uh, meanwhile, I'll ask you, what's the difference between uh, zombie consciousness and sentience? Well, I'm, well, the difference is just what I was trying to explain. It's, it's the whether or not, uh, in addition to zombie consciousness, some of the representations have phenomenal content, whether sensory representations have the qualia which distinguish them and make them so special. Um, and, so, and I think that uh, there's no reason to believe that once we've instilled something like a global workspace, let's say in a computer, that it will, by virtue of having that sort of consciousness, access to virtual, to, to, to what's going on inside its mechanical mind and so on, that it will be conscious, it will have introspective access, but it won't be having phenomenal experience just by virtue of that. And I think if that's the case for machines, then it's the case for animal machines at the beginning of life and quite a way through it. I think uh, I think consciousness, cognitive consciousness, the global workspace, as I said, is a clever trick invented by nature, probably many times over, not that difficult to engineer um, and probably therefore very widespread in the animal kingdom. And I mean, right the way down to, to you know, into honeybees and insects. I shouldn't say darn, but to include honeybees and insects and and uh, other creatures who show that kind of sophisticated intelligence and behavior. I don't think it goes right the way through the whole of the animal kingdom. I don't believe there's any reason to think that that uh, jellyfish uh, or earthworms, are probably not earthworms, have even that level of consciousness. I think they plain are unconscious, as are most computers today, as are LLMs, as we know them at the moment. But I do think that LLMs will quite shortly uh, be candidates for what we would call cognitive consciousness. We'll be able to ask them about what's going on in their, in their ro robot minds, and they'll be able to give uh, answers which correspond to the reality of their mental states. And for that token, they will be conscious. Okay, uh, let me take it back to the subject of the I mean, of this special session, which is which is Daniel Dennett. Mm -hmm. What would Daniel Dennett say about your distinction between consciousness and sentience, with all these other words like qualia and phenom phenomenal consciousness? Where are you in agreement, and where are you in disagreement with Dan Dennett? Well, we've had a running con uh, disagreement about. Qualia, uh, for as long as I know, and, and uh, I just can't persuade Dan that that is a useful term or refers to anything real in our experience. I think we, you know, I think he just doesn't get it, which is a surprising thing to say about a man who gets almost everything. But on other issues, Dan and I have pretty big disagreements. He thinks that phenomenal consciousness does go all the way down. He talks about hemi, semi, demi levels of consciousness. He thinks it's a continuum. Um, I think that's just unbiological and, 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 and against the evidence. It's, people claim it as a biological way of thinking because as Darwin emphasized, there is continuity in, in evolution, but there's continuity with very clear gaps in it. There are new abilities which emerge in the course of biological evolution, which were simply absent before. Um, and I suspect that phenomenal consciousness is one of them, that it came in, as I said, rather quickly, but relatively late in the course of evolution, but only in those animals which had particular kinds of brains and a particular use for phenomenal selfhood once it became available. We have a question from Aya Amer. Go ahead. And there's two others. Raise your Go ahead, Aya, and meanwhile, turn off your your hand so that I can see the other hands. Sure. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hello. So I have a question um, that's going to sound a little bit nitpicky, but it dovetails into a wider question that I had, which is, so you said about the octopuses that you don't believe that they are sentient, and you believe that if we did give them sentience, it wouldn't matter 
Um, I, I just wonder, does that not point to the fact that like sentience does not have an evolutionary purpose? If it does it, if it won't affect the behavior of the octopuses, if it won't give them any sort of evolutionary advantage. And then I guess the broader question is that uh, you mentioned that you believe sentience is useful because it allows us to have a sense of self. Um, and I'm wondering what you believe the, you know, competitive advantage that having that sense of self is well, what, think... what, what competitive advantage it grants. Well, it gives a, a kind of self-importance and individualism to the animal psychology, which I think is extremely valuable when you get into competition with other animals like yourself. But it's also valuable when you get into cooperation with other animals like yourself. And I emphasize that phenomenal selfhood comes into its own when you are living among other animals which have consciousness like yours. It's the basis for theory of mind. It allows you to use your own mind, your own phenomenally conscious mind, as a model for the other creatures you share uh, your society with. And that's uh, an absolute amazing achievement. It's led to you know, all the major advances in evolution which have occurred, um, particularly among social mammals and birds in the last 200 million years, which have basically, you know, life took off again once society developed in that way reason it wouldn't help octopuses is that they don't have societies. They don't live in the company of other octopus selves. They, they interact with them sometimes, but they don't have a complex social life. They don't cooperate. They don't, they don't even quarrel in meaningful ways. They're not friends um, with each other, despite the Netflix documentary. And therefore, when I say it wouldn't be any value, any value to them, it's because they don't have an eco occupy an ecological niche where that kind of social intelligence would pay off. Um, so it doesn't contradict the idea that, that phenomenal consciousness is adaptive in the right circumstances, but it's simply I'm saying that it wouldn't be adaptive in all circumstances. Um, and we're going to find that with AI as well and with robots. Uh, it's not going to, there would be no point in giving most robots at the moment any kind of phenomenal sense of self because they don't have an area to apply it in. If and when we want AIs to develop theory of mind and perhaps show empathy for other creatures like humans and like other robots for that matter, then it's a new ball, ball game. We may at that point want to think about how we could instill sentience in robots at that point. Um, and it may well be that we'll find it the right track to be to borrow a leaf from nature's book and to do it in very much the way that it's been done in the case of our own sentience by developing something like these feedback loops for example <clears throat> that just may be the best and, and the most straightforward way of doing it but there may be other ways of instilling sentience. Anna Strasser which... has a question go ahead. Is Anna there good? <clears throat> Hi, thanks a lot for this really nice pictures and videos and great talk. Um, so I have two things I want to um, mention. So first about DigiDan. OpenAI mm -hmm. retired DigiDan in January 2024, as they called it. So DigiDan was deleted before mm -hmm. Dan passed away. Just and disincarnated. And then, and so we had a conversation about that. So I asked Dan, what should I do in the case if you pass away? And so we had the agreement that I would delete DigiDan at the day of his death anyway. But OpenAI was faster by tidying, cleaning up their system and deleting DigiDan beforehand. And so I'm happy that this is done already. But... um. What I think is very important, if we sort of start to speculate what DigiDan would say or would not say, um, even though he cannot say anything, anything anymore, is that um, it was very important for Dan that any outputs of DigiDan has to be authorized by him. So um, I promised to him that I will never publish anything what DigiDan said without asking him beforehand. And so that means all the speculations what DigiDan would, might have said 
should also be um, mentioning that we cannot um, publish or um, publicly talk about um, Digidan outputs without his permission. And as we cannot get his permission anymore, we should maybe stop this specul speculation. This is not a critic. This is just uh, my personal stance on it. Um, but what is more important to me, I'm still deeply impressed by the story of Helen and the blind side um, thing. And um, thinking about that, I had the impression that your social behavior towards Helen made it possible for her to sort of come to come over, uh, to overcome the uncertainty with respect of the lack of sentience with concerning a visual visual experiences, and um, so the question I'm formulating now is sort of a little bit speculative, because of course um, artificial systems do not have other sentience parts. So they are non-sentient system all the way through. But could you think that if we sort of treat them like we treat little children as social interaction partners, that this could sort of drive the development of them making use of cognitive cogn consciousness, which they might have in the future? So, so it's speculative because I would not agree that any system we know of has already cognitive consciousness. But if it would have, could I sort of help the system to make use of it by treating it as a social interaction? Well, um, first look first about Digidan and Rildan. I'm interested that that was his attitude. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dan actually uh, is now slightly regretting that decision. Maybe it was chat, D, G, chat, chat GPT-3, wasn't it? So it wasn't as good as it could have been, but I think Dan rather fancied the idea that he could live on and his ideas would, would be expressed, even in ways he hadn't yet thought of himself through a model of that kind. And and, and why not? I know, mean, as I said, it, it lacked it lacked uh, reality in other respects, and he would have hated to have missed out on, on, on the life of the body. But nonetheless, you know, that's, if supposing we could have Digi Socrates, um, wouldn't I, I think that would be a wonderful resource? I mean, supposing he'd really been trained on all the texts which we've never even seen from Socrates, um, I think it would have been a boon to the world and a boon certainly to Socrates' reputation. And equally, I think Dan deserves to live on. He does live on through his works anyway. Of course he does. And that's what he was acknowledging in that, in that film clip at the beginning. But I think it could have been at a level which I, I mean, I understand your, your your sensitivity about that, but nonetheless, I'm, I think it's, you know, we we could say, well, maybe you should just have put it in a cupboard and not destroyed it. Um, As we're running that out was of your... time. As we're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. So, short... so quick, 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 quick question, sorry, quick answer about the, about uh, interacting with, with, with animals. Yes, uh, I think it's absolutely crucial to bring out, you don't bring out uh, these high level capacities in animals or in machines until you ask them, pose the questions to them, to which those it, their capabilities would become relevant. And of course, human social interaction, we're very used to doing that. I mean, you are probably, I don't know if you have children, but you know, mothers coax this kind of self-belief out of children from the very beginning. Um, yeah. So all I was doing with Helen in a way was repetition of that kind of maternal interaction. Um, but it does take, that kind of interaction, and the, and I agree. I don't. I think there's never been never been another monkey like Helen, and it had very likely something to do with my peculiar relationship to her. Three quick questions, three short answers. Short question, short answers. Friedemann Pulvermüller, Alina Gutorieva, and Steve Hansen, and then it's over. Friedemann, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for this thoughtful uh, talk. Uh, let me ask: um, You mentioned the possibility of um, of of ha having a state uh, being in a state, uh, but not being uh, sentient. Uh, sentient. 
of this state. You mentioned a frog as an example uh, of an individual being uh, which may be hungry without the sentient, without the hungriness mm -hmm. sentience, if I understand correctly. Is mm -hmm. this understanding correct? If yes, what are the criterion, the, the criteria for deciding that st state X is present, but sentience of X is not? Well, that's not a short, I can't give a short answer to that. It's exactly the right, the right question. Uh, I think in the case of frogs, I wouldn't take hunger, I take vision. I think they're not sentient of vision. I think they have blind sight. Um, uh, there are some peculiarities about blind sight, which I would love to have time to go into one or two oddities about it, which I think do give clues to how we might detect it in, in animals. But um, afraid that's going to be have to be okay. a longer and separate answer. Okay, let's but move to of course, it's the right question. How, how do we tell? Yeah. Yes, next, next question. Mr. We can't pursue that because there's just no time. Alina, say it quickly. Uh, sure. I just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful talk, Nick, and uh, for the overview of Daniel Dennett's biography experiences and thoughts, uh, possibilities of immortality, um, and reminding us that uh, we live in the minds of our loved ones. So thank you for that. My question is about, um, is it correct Rather, maybe um, clarification. So, is it correct that you suggest that sentience requires um, empathy, theory of mind, and vision? I didn't quite get the link between sentience um, and no, vision. It's, not so, and, it's great. Well, thank you. Theory of mind, I think, requires sentience, not sentience requires mm -hmm. theory of mind. So, theory of mind at a high level is, to my, I think, very good evidence that the subjects of it are. Uh, have sentience um, uh, and have phenomenal consciousness. Uh, it's, I mean, again, I can refer you to my book, but that's not a fair thing to do, to argue in, what, in particular what kinds of uh, uh, dimensions of mind are revealed and um, described in terms of sentience, which would be very difficult to describe and summarize in any other way. So I think it's a shortcut to a theory of mind. Um, but I think they are absolutely linked. Okay, last Thank question, you. short question, short answer, Steve Hansen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Ah, excellent. Uh, lovely talk. I, I especially enjoyed the history of blindsight. Uh, I, I'd known a lot about this work uh, from the visits at uh, Oxford, Cambridge, different times. Mm -hmm. But my question is this, uh, LLMs, this is short, probably not easy to answer. Uh, are known to have huge attractor states. We've measured all kinds of attractor states in this that make a huge amount of sense. Uh, but we, no one knows how they work. That's just flat out. We just have to accept this was a discovery, not an invention. Now, your theory, which is really uh, fascinating, appeals to attractor states and recurrence and feedback loops and so on. And so it seems that we're backed into an awkward space where we have to figure out what kind of attractor states that we care about and what kind of attractor space are going to have something to do with consciousness and sentience and, and all the rest. Yes, of course. And it's, it's not going to be me who does that. I, I haven't got the mathematical sophistication to to actually make concrete suggestions about uh, how, how where to go with that, but I hope others will. I think it's, I mean, the great thing, you know, it makes it in a sense attractor states make everything too easy because they do have these hyperdimensional properties. I mean, some attractor states require an infinite number of dimensions to characterize them. That gives plenty of scope for natural selection to pick and choose in terms of deciding what's going to work in terms of a creature's psychology. Um, but it certainly, yes, it's, uh, we need much more sophisticated analysis than I could ever give. And at the age of 81, I'm not going to start. Um, but I hope there'll be other, others who might take up these ideas. Thanks very much, Nick. It was a very stimulating and uh, prov provocative presentation. Well, thanks to you. We'll continue uh, at 1.30 our time.
Sir, 